free space. I mean, think about the communication that is happening between the Mars rover and our Earth uh, deep space network. So that kind of things are there. So now we can formally define the antenna that uh, from dictionary point of view, it says that it is usually a me metallic device such as the rod or wire that is used for radiating or receiving the radio waves. But the IEEE standard definition of the term for antenna is basically not like, I mean, considering this particular part, I mean, you can see that uh, this metallic device, uh, rod or wire, this particular thing is not uh, that much highlighted. It's uh, any means for radiating and receiving radio waves. So that's the part I wanted to, I mean, technically highlight. And in terms of computer's language, it is basically an interface or transitional structure between free space and the guiding device. So it can be in the transmitter end, it can be in the receiver end. If you just think in terms of the transmitter end, then we have, uh, we can see this model like this, uh, there is a source and we have some kind of transmission line or waveguide and we want to generate this uh, uh, radiated free space waves, these bubbles of uh, electromagnetic waves from a guided wave kind of structure. So that transition, that interfacing is being done by this particular antenna system over here. So this is well, I, very roughly, I wanted to define uh, the antennas for from a layman's perspective. But if you look into that, how did all these things, I mean, come into the picture? And since when we uh, were uh, trying to conceptualize a kind of wireless communication framework. So if we uh, think about that, we have to go back to the days when uh, Henrik Hertz did his first experiment. He did not think of it as some kind of uh, antenna experiment. It was, I mean, if you read the history, it was just probably to debug some of the things that some electrical engineers observed. And so what apparatus he uh, used, if you look into these apparatus over here, it is very interesting that uh, it is having an end loaded dipole driven by an induction coil and a spark gap for the transmitter. So if you look into that end loaded dipole, this particular thing is essentially, I mean, this loading you can see over here, the end loading kind of things that you can observe. And the spark gap, I mean, it's pretty uh, clearly seen over here that the spark gap is located and we have this induction coil that is producing a very high voltage. Now, from here, uh, what is happening when we are uh, creating this kind of sparks at this point, it is basically generated some kind of electric, uh, electromagnetic waves. I mean, the wave fronts, it is probably not that clearly visible. So I try, I'm just trying to very crudely draw that. So the wave fronts are actually, the wave is actually uh, like impinging upon this another thing. Like this is the electromagnetic waves that is creating the electric current in this particular resonator. So here is another one more spark gap. So we can say that this is kind of the transmitter and this is kind of the receiver, receiving coil over here. So in that way, uh, I mean, uh, the small uh, loop that acted as a receiver, the, it detected the induced sparking. So some spark was happening here and some induced sparking is being seen over here. So this is, I mean, the first experiment in back in 1887. So you can, uh, I mean, quickly calculate the uh, like number of years, almost 130, 140 years back. And this was, I mean, uh, in, done in, of course, in the indoor uh, environment. More about this uh, early experiment of this Hertz radiator and the resonator for creation and detection of electromagnetic waves. So this is the stepping stone. This is the first step. But... Uh, that was motivated from the research that was parallelly going on with respect to the Maxwell's equation. I will come into that maybe in the later stage of the talk, but the Maxwell's V-side equation that actually motivated people to think in this direction that the existence of electromagnetic waves and whether they can be used for some uh, beneficial purpose. So at that point, probably at the point of this particular experiment, it was not envisioned that this will lead to this kind of wireless revolution in uh, the present day. And when we are talking about wireless communication and uh, we must uh, acknowledge, and this is very crucial, that uh, our own Acharya Jagadish Chandra Bose gave the first demonstration of electromagnetic waves in 1895 by using them to ring a bell remotely 
and explode some gunpowder. I mean, most of us uh, have probably heard about this experiment. And if you see, in 1896, the Daily Chronicle of England reported that the inventor, J.C. Bose, has transmitted signals to a distance of nearly a mile. And herein lies the first and obvious and exceedingly valuable application for this new theoretical marvel. So uh, this is uh, very important because we are at present looking into when we are talking about all this 5G and going into the 6G, many of the research labs are trying to promote their works as 6G and uh, I mean, uh, saying that it is in the, done in the millimeter wave frequency range and stuff like that. So if you see that Bose described to the Royal Institution of London his research carried out in Calcutta at millimeter wavelengths. So uh, basically the kind of 6G devices uh, that we are thinking of right now, he designed all those things with his genius that used waveguides and horn antennas and dielectric lenses, various polarizers and even semiconductors at the frequencies as high as the 60 gigahertz. So uh, I would uh, strongly suggest, I mean, the students as well as the young professionals and faculty members to go through this particular paper and many other uh, related literature that the work done by Jagadish Chandra Bose, 100 years of millimeter wave research that uh, published I mean, around uh, 97 by Emerson. So this particular paper. And when we are talking about the uh, development in the wireless communication systems, we have to acknowledge the work by Marconi that Marconi achieved a transmission distance about 2.5 kilometers using earth and an elevated aerial at both transmitter and the receiver, which we, was called basically the Marconi antenna. And this is some picture that is taken by uh, from this particular spot, Poldu and Cornwall in December 1901. But uh, more by circumstance than design, uh, he uh, like uh, tried to uh, obtain this transatlantic communication. And uh, I mean, uh, there are uh, there are stuff that he assumed, but now we know that those are kind of not the correct assumptions. But, but anyway, th that thing worked, and eventually, for these contributions in the uh, transatlantic, I mean, telegraphic uh, kind of uh, communication, uh, he got the Nobel Prize. So. From the antenna engineer perspective, we generally call the Marconi antenna, this typical quarter wavelength uh, ground plane, uh, like vertical antenna. If you see the picture, typical the ground plane antenna, there is a coaxial transmission line over here and a vertical kind of radiator and some quarter wave uh, ground plane uh, rods are there. So uh, it is kind of very similar to the uh, like uh, antenna that we generally draw that, okay, this is the uh, ground plane and we have some kind of a source sitting over here. And then we plot uh, the corresponding, uh, like where, uh, pardon my very poor drawing. But anyway, so this is a sinusoidal kind of source and we can use this kind of a, like rough schematic I'm trying to show, a quarter wave dipole. So uh, it was called the vertical Marconi antenna. So now let us come back, I mean, from the historical days, if we come back to our uh, real life and we now have our cell phone handsets that have antennas as the very uh, key or integral component. And how, uh, if you uh, just uh, think about the development that started to happen, it was, its uh, roots were, I mean, or seeds were sown uh, back in the days of the world wars. And these are the military grid, portable AM and FM uh, wave uh, radios that are here. If you notice that the size of this kind of device that uh, the army person is probably using and uh, the stuff that we use now, there is a significant contrast in the size and the way and the mechanism also. It was simply the AM and FM kind of uh, radio they had. And then, uh, but uh, this is for the military application. This was not for civilian application. When civilian applications, we started looking into uh, uh, the first generation of the cellular communication system, we have to acknowledge this Motorola Dynatac or portable cellular phone. And this is a picture for of one businessman using that kind of uh, cell phone. Uh, the picture of the cell phone is here. So uh, this particular uh, thing, I mean, started when we were thinking about the cordless uh, cell phones and all those kind of uh, stuff and that are kind of currently that are moving towards the direction when we are getting a lot of uh, fancy things. I mean, 
at the primitive level it was mostly for the voice communication but now essentially it has become into a very small packaged integrated computer system that is connected to the internet that can do the data processing and a lot of fascinating stuff so uh, just uh, look into the like gradual change and the role the different antennas uh, antenna evolution played in uh, making these kind of devices compact i mean one clear change that you can observe without even going into any circuits or any internal mechanisms that this protruding thing that is uh, coming out of the phone it's no longer here and this is just 2000 i mean uh, 20 years back so this is not here if you look into any present day smartphone uh, there is no protruding antenna so what happened over here so there are a lot of uh, of course in the various other domains and other uh, attributes there were research but since this talk is presently focused on the antenna so i'll just briefly show that how this uh, research on the antennas actually uh, uh, changed i mean uh, this get up of the cell phones at least on the outside so Generally, this uh, early days, first generation cell phones, the type of antenna that were used here, it is basically the sleeve dipole. And uh, the sleeve is basically, you can see that uh, we have the coaxial transmission line and there is a dielectric insert and there is a metal sleeve that is there. I mean, sleeve is very similar to, uh, you can uh, pictureize your shirt and the way we fold it sometimes. So, for um, uh, this is the part that we call uh, the sleeve or from the antenna design perspective and this inner conductor inner conductor is going out so without this sleeve there was a lot of issues regarding the balanced and unbalanced currents and also stability of the radiation pattern so the role of the dielectric insert as well as the sleeve was not to st not only to stabilize the pattern but also to i mean uh, work on the matching and all those parts so the antenna engineering was there so this thing was i mean you can quickly notice the visual uh, similarity and by pattern we mean that when I am having uh, this kind of a uh, phone over here I would ideally like to uh, like get the signal from these various directions I mean uh, for from any direction I would like to uh, like transmit as well as receive so bi-directional I want to I mean just I'm saying from a, a very general perspective that when I am holding the phone, I would ideally want to capture the signal from all the directions. And that actually you can see it is manifested in the corresponding uh, radiation pattern over here, which we generally call it omnidirectional. So there is a null along this Z direction, along this direction. But the signal, uh, I mean, the directivity pattern is kind of uh, symmetric along this azimuth plane. So this we generally call the azimuth angle. I mean, the phi that, you, that we call, and this is your theta that is the elevation plane so elevation and azimuth all these kind of things we have to think when we i mean that uh, 3d geometry and how we place the antennas all these kind of things matter and uh, in terms of when we are trying to make the things compact another thing another development was this whip antenna so i just opened i mean uh, a picture that had this outer uh, thing uh, like removed so you can see a kind of spring type of thing and whip antenna. So essentially we needed to build small compact antenna systems that are integrated to the cell phone and that can uh, transmit as well as receive signals from a relatively omnidirectional perspective. And that perspective is given from the user point of view, the way we are doing. So this is just the user uh, specific uh, handset that uh, it, it is there. Then uh, there is this, uh, uh, I mean, from the cell phone perspective only, the printed technology played a very significant role. And you can see now uh, we are starting to use this meandered monopole and inverted F, F antennas. And these are essentially uh, the things that are used in your present day cell phones also. But <laughs> this complicated design that you have, this is still some time old. And in the present day phones, the antennas will be mostly located along the rims and all those things and I have not got, gone into that but this is just the historical perspective that this inverted F kind of geometry and you can see I mean what kind of engineering has gone into developing this antenna there are a lot of things parasitic elements uh, several parasitic elements in fact then uh, capacitive loading inductive loadings will also be used in many places but the objectives are very clear there are certain frequency ranges that we have to uh, make our cell phones operate 
and uh, that frequency ranges have to be covered with a decent radiation pattern and a proper gain and all those constraints are given and this is how the antenna research is uh, focused in terms of uh, a, when you talk about the cell phone perspective. So uh, the handsets, I mean, uh, some of the example what goes through this process is that we have to analyze the currents on the antenna system and how the current, uh, we cannot think of the current on the antenna only. Since it is an integrated device, the placement of the other things, let's say the battery, this is an old, uh, probably I think, yeah, Motorola T193 phone and it is using a planar inverted F antenna. So being antenna engineer, we have to look into these currents and we have to see that whether the currents are causing additional heating and other effects in any other uh, nearby regions or uh, the circuits nearby and how uh, essentially the overall phone structure will also in fact uh, affect the kind of radiation and the kind of performance that the antenna will give. So it is very easy to I mean, design a particular antenna in a printed circuit board and just get the measurement and all those things done. But when we work into the world of uh, real life antenna engineering, we have to look into these parasitic effects, the effects due to the nearby circuits, the effects due to uh, the human phantom, which is not, I mean, I have not shown in this slide, but maybe later on I have that particular slide. And how the placement of the human phantom is actually affecting the electromagnetic energy distribution on that. And of course, the radiation pattern. So this is a representative of the uh, radiation pattern from the antennas. And I'm pretty sure that over the last few days, uh, there were many workshops and, uh, and the other speakers also maybe showed you the explanation of this kind of radiation patterns. And these are actually dependent on the uh, way the different companies actually design and place their antenna. So these are two different, that's why I wanted to show it, like two different companies and two different generations of phones, two different frequency ranges. The objectives are kind of uh, what we are looking into, the parameters are kind of the same, like the surface currents and the 3D radiation patterns, but the engineering changes, engineering changes depending on the situation. So these pictures actually I have taken from very nice paper, this one is, mobile phone antenna design. This appeared in the magazine back in 2012. So I'll again suggest people to just go through that because this is very important. Sometimes we try start designing some stuff without uh, going into the context. I mean, that is fine, but we have to understand the context from the academic research perspective also when we are trying to put any new concept. We have to uh, think that whether this is actually useful or some people have already done that or not, that thought process should be there. Now, not only the cell phones, I mean, the other devices that we have, let's say the laptops. So there are a lot of patents as, as well as antennas in that. And you can see that the, uh, like, uh, the requirements now have changed. I mean, uh, the antenna that I, have, I showed for the previous cell phones throughout the different generations. And now the antennas that we are going to use or we are currently using in our laptops for various purposes. Let's say we want to connect it to the Wi-Fi. So there has to be some antenna, isn't it? I mean, in the system. So what type of locations do we prefer putting in the antennas and how do we excite them? And the boundary conditions have changed. I mean, uh, the size of the device and the placement of the things, those things have changed. So this is uh, uh, two more examples regarding the uh, antennas for the laptop application. So essentially, if you look like starting from the handset, starting from the laptops and some of the devices that we have with us, uh, let's say a Bluetooth driven Fitbit that we wear for uh, like measuring our uh, number of steps or various other purpose. It can measure your uh, like blood sugar level or uh, stuff like that, biomedical kind of application or uh, some of the RFID tags and uh, like which we uh, use in in, uh, I mean, uh, sometimes the RFID based uh, identification, I mean, uh, for various objects that we sometimes do in shops and other places. So essentially the whole world of the com uh, consumer electronics is now uh, looking into integration of different antennas because in the 6G, in the vision for the 6G, we are essentially looking into internet of things and con connected devices. I'll show probably one slide on that, one slide on that. But the point is, uh, whenever we are looking for this kind of uh, wireless connectivity, we need to integrate the antenna 
alongside the electronics. So it has been an indispensable component. And a lot of time what happens is the guided wave electronics that can operate in a relatively more robust way as compared to the antenna. So that's why we need uh, more and more uh, thrust and more and more uh, like proper investigation into this kind of systems. So uh, another, I mean, just example of the antenna for the laptop that I was showing, some different uh, E-shaped patches. You can see that simple patch element, how much area it would have occupied. But when we uh, they place this kind of uh, dual band back-to-back E-shaped -back e patch, and what are the locations and uh, the more number of antennas they try to put in so that we can have some kind of uh, MIMO and diversity kind of operation to enhance the data rate. So these kind of things are uh, there. Now, uh, this is one of the things that I generally tell in the class when I talk about the coordinate system in the antenna. And this also, uh, I mean, uh, goes into uh, the other part. Like sometimes while only thinking about the consumer electronics even things, we uh, generally tend to focus on those parts only. But there are other relevant challenges in uh, designing antenna systems, which is not only building the small compact antenna systems, but also building high gain and large antennas that are used in the deep space network. So this is one of the things that I wanted to show you that there is this uh, like uh, deep space network in for uh, the NASA missions. And uh, the uh, purpose of the deep space network is to get proper connectivity with the orbiters and the orbiter in a way will connect to the uh, rover and I mean get the proper feedback to Earth. So this is how generally a, a typical link in that kind of uh, interplanetary communication works. So this is a picture for the Curiosity rover. Of course, now we know the Perseverance and all they have landed. And there are these orbiters. So you can see that how uh, far these two uh, systems are. I mean, this is just drawn in a picture. So the challenge is to uh, communicate within these far distances. And in the far field region, we are mostly looking into the directional coordinates. So that is why I put the title of the slides like this coordinates in antenna system. But the objective is also to uh, em, uh, like emphasize upon the interplanetary communication part. And if you look into uh, this uh, different antennas that are used in the rover itself, I mean, the previous slide, you can see the rover sitting over here. But just a zoom picture of this one, that how different types of antennas are used in the rover itself. So this is a low gain antenna. And the purpose of that is essentially, I mean, low gain that can be a omnidirectional kind of system that can catch up the signal from uh, like uh, this azimuthal kind of, uh, I'm saying the symmetrically from the various azimuth directions that is there. And, uh, but another part is there will be some high gain antennas as well, which will have a different kind of radiation pattern. So these two figures, actually, these are not, I mean, uh, patterns for these antennas, but these are just, I wanted to uh, uh, put it there for the illustration purpose. So uh, my point is that I want to again re-emphasize that the rover has both low gain and high gain antenna that serves as its voice and as its ears. You can think like that. And they are located into the rover equipment deck, which is often called, like this is the equipment deck and it is called uh, its back of the system. And the low gain antenna actually sends and receives information in every direction. That is, it's kind of the omnidirectional system. And uh, it transmits the radio waves at uh, like some low rate to the uh, deep space network antennas on the earth. And the high gain antenna can send a beam of information in a specific direction. And this is also steerable. So the antenna can move to point itself directly to any antenna on earth. Just, I mean, in our real life we do when we are talking to somebody, we try to see that, okay, from this direction, this guy is talking. So we try to... Uh, change our uh, orientation and uh, try to look him in the eye or her in the eye. So that way, this is the exact uh, like thought process that goes when we are trying to design a steerable kind of link. So uh, benefit of the steerable antenna is definitely that the entire rover doesn't necessarily have to change the positions to talk to art. So this is, uh, I wanted to uh, put this contrasting example with respect to the cell phone antenna or the laptop antenna because uh, this space application and the interplanetary communication application, they have their own challenges and own integration requirements. So the antenna that I'm designing for a Mars rover will not be useful for a cell phone antenna. This is very obvious, but sometimes people uh, tend to like uh, homogenize everything. So uh, 
since I talked about some of the NASA part, so it is very important that we look into the ISRO part as well. So deep space network I was mentioning. So we, from the Indian perspective, we have the Indian deep space network commissioned during the year 2008 at the Bayalalu village near Bengaluru. And it forms the ground segment for providing the deep space support for different India's space science missions, like the lunar mission, the Chandrayaan and the Mars orbiter mission, which we already have done. And the Indian Space Science Data Center, ISSDC, is located at the IDSN campus, primary data center for the data archive. So just a uh, uh, heads up on that. And this IDSN complex and these deep space antennas, if you see the size of these antennas, I mean, you can see how big they are and uh, 18 meter and 32 meter capable of supporting interplanetary mission. So more uh, like uh, the size of the antenna, it uh, translates into having the higher gains and higher gain it will eventually uh, lead to, I mean, uh, uh, the better uh, like, uh, like the link performance and all those things when we are looking into this kind of interplanetary missions. So uh, this is another example, uh, not only the space, this kind of uh, planetary missions, but also there are application in the context of radio astronomy. And this is also a very proud thing from an Indian perspective that we have the GMRT, the Giant Meter Wave Radio Telescope. It's located at a site about 80 kilometers north of Pune. So NCRA has set up this unique facility and it is using the meter wavelength range. So you can see that the contrasting uh, requirements are actually leading into development of different types of antennas. So why antenna research is needed, that particular question I'm trying to answer over here because there are several problems that we have to solve and the solution of all those problems, engineering problems, a broad section of this kind of uh, situations, they require a proper innovation and proper uh, development in the terms of our antenna research. So this is a meter wavelength thing, but when we are looking into the cell phone thing, uh, again, the frequency ranges are kind of different. So you can see that although, I mean, there are many astounding uh, astrophysics problems which are best studied at meter wavelengths, no large facility anywhere in the world to exploit this part of spectrum for astrophysical research. So interested people who are interested to work in this radio astronomy, they can visit uh, this uh, website and find more details about that. Another uh, very uh, common thing that is uh, like relevant to our daily life is antennas for the television application. And the UHF frequency range, uh, I mean, uh, during our childhood, mostly we used to see this kind of antennas. Uh, these are Yakuda kind of uh, radiators that have several directors, one reflector and one director, I mean, one exciter kind of thing. But now we are looking into these dish antennas and parabolic reflectors and uh, uh, where we have some kind of feed. And you can see these installations in uh, the roofs of several housing apartments in the present day. So again, the requirements are for the TV uh, transmission, television, uh, video uh, like transmission, that is drastically different from what we have in case of a cell phone. So again, there is a contrast and whenever there is a contrast, there is the scope of uh, research in there. Again, let us switch back to some other thing, which is the antennas for the aircraft. So uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, the aircrafts, the way we are now operating at the level that when we have a uh, very low uh, kind of uh, in number of accidents, thankfully, and that's why it has become a very resilient and uh, I mean, dependable kind of uh, like uh, aerial communication. So in order to uh, uh, like get to that level, you can see that what type of different systems are needed for integration in this uh, aircraft. So this is just a picture that I took for a Boeing 787 and 10, I mean, uh, aircraft. And you can notice the different systems that are there, starting from the global positioning system, terminal cellular system, automatic direction finder, and uh, the crew wireless land unit and uh, emergency locator. So, and another very important, I mean, this part, the air traffic control and traffic collision and avoidance system. So all these different systems that are integrated in this aircraft, they require different, different types of antennas. So again, if somebody asks you that why we need antenna research, you can simply show him this picture and see, say that this is a very, I mean, important uh, part in our uh, modern civilization, I can say. 
which is intrinsically dependent on uh, antenna research. I mean, I am not saying only antenna research, but <laughs> definitely antenna research is one important component. And if we look into the security from any country perspective, uh, and we need to be secured from different threats. So if you look into the requirements from our DRDO has or uh, the website of some other uh, agencies from different countries. So generally they have these active array antenna array units, which is a combined antenna system for radar and identification friend and for IFF, radar and IFF system sometimes they call of airborne early warning and control system. So essentially the basic of this thing is we have some kind of phased array and by phased array, it is no, no, no longer a single antenna system. It is an array of antennas, as you can see. And we have this kind of uh, uh, like uh, power dividers or beam forming network that is uh, basically leading into a constructive and destructive interference of the electromagnetic waves at various locations. At some desired locations, we want to get the beam to be steered. So that thing is performed by this uh, active antenna array unit. And the antenna unit uh, like uh, provides the fully active electronic scanning array, AESA for radar and this passive electronic scanning antenna for IFF. And it has also the built-in controller unit with multiple units to provide beam steering, supports multiple interfaces. So you can see, I mean, these are details I have taken from this uh, DRDO link. You can uh, go into there and see more details. And uh, what is the active scanned array? And this is also very important from a aircraft and uh, military aircraft perspective also. So not only the antenna, here I would like to uh, highlight one particular thing that when we are saying that we are designing antenna system, one thing we are uh, carefully, I mean, we have not mentioned yet, but that has to be there. That is the packaging and the redome kind of things that are needed uh, over these antennas. So when you design the antenna, you have to eventually place it in or install it in some, uh, with, uh, along with some system. And your cell phone uh, antenna might not need that kind of a big uh, redome kind of thing, but when you uh, think about the military application, there is the challenge that whenever we are putting these antennas, we are actually, we can, uh, uh, I mean, automatically increase the radar cross section of these kind of devices. And then stealth becomes a very vital issue. And when we have to look into the stealth purpose, so uh, we want to hide our aircraft, we want to hide that system from the enemy radars. And that requires that we will have to conceal those antenna systems with some kind of uh, structure, with some kind of a uh, frequency selective surface, so that it actually selectively absorbs uh, the, those, uh, I mean, uh, frequencies where it is probably uh, operating. So, this is a very like integrated antenna radon problem and it is very much uh, important in the context of uh, these aircrafts and still the aircrafts and all those things. So there is a scope of, I mean, immense uh, research in uh, this direction when we see, and this is another, I mean, uh, from uh, coming from the same way that we talk, we are talking about the manned aircraft so far, but now unmanned aerial vehicles are also uh, I mean, if you look into some of the recent uh, wars and all, so the uh, side which had the UAVs, they had the edge. So unmanned aerial vehicles and not only, I mean, from the I mean military perspective, but also you can see this particular example, like information dissemination and data collection. If you want to find out that, okay, this terrain, what is the forest uh, like uh, density or the soil content and tomographical application. So, uh, that information dissemination data collection thing is there. And then also there is the situation that when we have a malfunctioning base station, let's say due to some natural disaster, then the unmanned aerial vehicles or a swarm of drones can actually uh, like operate to uh, give the necessary, I mean, uh, like functionalities in that uh, vision. So the point is that when we have this human intervention and control, that is some kind of we can have a person that is controlling but when we are looking into this autonomous and uh, uh, also unmanned so in that case we have to be like uh, very much like there are some additional challenges and we have to be very precise in terms of uh, like uh, like the control purpose so that controlling thing that will require again the wireless links are needed 
and the wireless links that uh, we have some ground terminals, we have some satellite and ground control stations, but what about the antennas on these uh, UAVs itself? How to design uh, the proper antenna systems that will be robust in uh, that kind of uh, operation environment. And I said that ground terminals, ground terminals also they, they will require that when we have a, such a challenging situation, a vehicle flying at some uh, speeds on 100 kilometers per hour or maybe uh, some uh, more or less than that. So how to get a proper robust working link with that UAV? That is again a challenge. So uh, like uh, this is, uh, I mean, uh, the drone that part I mentioned, that how to like this UAV, a small version of that is this kind of military drone. So, I mean, not that drone that we talk about in the biology, but anyway, so this kind of uh, systems, how to uh, in, uh, integrate the antennas with it and how to design a complete system that can we can operate from the ground and we can control the height, we can move it around, we can capture the data. So when we are saying that we are capturing the data, okay, that can be done from the camera and that can store it in, it in, uh, in its local uh, like uh, system. But from that, we want to get that uh, data, like if it is a high resolution image, then we want to get that data back into our ground station or ground control station. So again, we have to facilitate the high data rate communication over there. And that again, you can see that eventually it is leading into the domain of wireless communication and we have to operate the antenna again. We have to work on the proper beam direction, how to control it, how to tilt it. So these factors all are coming into the same fold. So nothing is, I mean, completely disconnected from the research that we are doing. Again, I'm jumping to another very relevant uh, direction that our present society is going in through, that we are looking into the, uh, I mean, connected uh, vehicles and uh, like millimeter wave sensors and plug-in modules that are going to be used in this kind of uh, systems. So one of the, like uh, this intelligent millimeter wave sensor, 60 to 64 gigahertz millimeter wave sensor, so they require this MIMO radars. So this is another multiple input, multiple, multiple output radar system. So you can see that antenna on chip and all those things that people talk about. So you can see the various electronics, various side of the other side of the electronics, VLSI and circuit engineering and design of the digital signal processors all over there. But this guy is sitting right over here. That is your MIMO radar module. So we have four transmit antennas over here. You can notice that four transmit are here. And you can see that the different uh, like, uh, like, like receive units. I mean, receive units are kind of uh, three. Uh, sorry, I, like, I'm probably wrong that these three transmit units over here and four receivers over there. So that is how we are essentially uh, like uh, operating this MIMO radar kind of system. So what it does is four receive and three transmit antenna with 120 degree azimuth field of view and 30 degree elevation field of view. So these are the requirements. We know of, of uh, TI as a semiconductor giant, but when they are building these chips, they require actually the significant amount of engineering in terms of the antenna. So, I mean, people who are slightly more mature in the antenna design part, they can quickly recognize these as the series fade arrays and uh, stuff like that. But how to place these antennas? So, the, how to place these transmit antennas, how to place these receive antennas, and how to get the system optimally going? And not only that, these are several requirements and power consumption and heating requirements will be there. So essentially it is integrated with the circuit research. But then we have to encase this particular chip in a proper environment. And uh, the way uh, it works is when we uh, put it inside the radome, that radome design itself is a challenging part. So essentially the research on antennas eventually expands into the research on combined antenna, I mean combined uh, applied electromagnetics part. And some more example where I talked about the connected vehicle and the vehicular radar kind of application. And uh, I mean, people are working with several uh, these uh, uh, like automobile companies and automobile industries are seriously looking into the research on antennas and beam forming and design of the vehicular uh, radar kind of uh, stuff. And finally, I will little bit talk about the antenna for internet of things that we uh, think of the cellular phone and the present day industry like 5G and all those kind of stuff, very high data rate 
and data it's up to 10 gbps using the millimeter wave bands with high spectrum through the use of these advanced modulation schemes like 64 qam wave tm or the multi user mimo massive mimo and in the present day we are looking into the intelligent reflecting surfaces for also several applications but when we talk about the internet of things iot the iot networks and devices they are not their requirements are not exactly uh, same as this high throughput wireless networks so here we are mostly looking to leveraging the license and unlicensed subsidized charge bands using limited bandwidth and use uh, several i mean conventional topologies like star mesh and point to point topologies to guide uplinks and downlinks between the gateways and several of these end devices so therefore the requirement of antennas for the iot networks it is uh, drastically different from the other things we are talking about so one needs to deploy relatively simple low cost omnidirectional cheap or pcb based antennas often using the off the shelf components so you can see some of the antennas that i have uh, taken some of the iot antenna product they are fairly simple and how it is done in some of these devices this is the casing and the battery and the pcb is there and the complete pcb you can see a very simple antenna i mean uh, inverted if kind of a uh, structure i modified with some of the slots and uh, the stands and meandering to actually operate at a certain frequency band within a small footprint but there is a whole lot of electronics that is there and that has to eventually so this also i mean uh, gives you the idea that the basic definition of the antenna that is a transitioning device between the guiding thing and the free space so that few point is also you can see and another thing i mean one uh, this is probably the uh, last example that i had uh, for the biomedical devices so you can see that uh, um, uh, by placing this smart pills inside the smart pills again there is whole lot of electronics and some of these antennas that they can perform this control drug delivery to treat diseases like malaria and alzheimers and uh, control release like place this device inside the human system and that can actually inform that okay this is now the condition so now the control drug delivery can be performed so implanted medical devices and uh, wearable electronics and all those stuff they require significant i mean research on antennas and this is a whole dimension to the antenna research we do because now our environment is more like it is more in the close to hold with the bio science people and we have to model the proper tissue it's a proper uh, uh, dielectric properties and uh, i mean a whole lot of thing that comes alongside that how to impedance match the system when it is not in a free space when it is inside the body how much power it can radiate how much is a specific absorption rate so all these things come so the research on antennas uh, that my objective was for, by showing different examples like this was to point out that it is a holistic thing and we have to think about it in terms of problem solving way and identify the problems that are needed for our uh, real life as well as some of the research like uh, space and all those things so uh, i just the summary what i told told so far that cellular handsets laptops and television i discuss about what type of things are needed for space satellite and radio astronomy i also talked about the security and defense part aircrafts and radars millimeter wave sensors and vehicular radar vehicular technology internet of thing and wireless devices biomedical applications and many more i mean this is not i mean the exhaustive list this is just what uh, what are the things that came to my mind when i thought about the research on antennas so now we have to uh, look into the other part that uh, how uh, computational electromagnetics is actually coming into the picture so in order to go in that direction we have to ask ourselves like what are the pertinent questions about the antenna operation and what are the tools that are available at our disposal to solve these various antenna problems so we identified we identified what we call about antenna what we mean by antennas we said that why the research on antennas is required because it is uh, essential part of all these systems that are uh, like defining our human civilization at the moment so now comes the important part that what are the tools available at our disposal to solve these various antenna problems 
So in order to go into that, we have to acknowledge that um, uh, we are looking into a specific spectrum, electromagnetic spectrum, when I'm talking about these uh, antennas. And I mean, starting from uh, mostly we are talking from these radio waves, microwaves. And also, I did not mention in the slides, like the optical antennas and uh, the antennas in the antenna systems in the terahertz and infrared kind of systems. Mostly in my talk, I talked about this uh, uh, UHF and sub terahertz kind of regime. But my point is, anywhere we, anywhere we need the uh, wireless kind of uh, communication systems without any guiding network. Because in optics, we have the fiber optics, which is quite a well-developed field. But when we look into some other uh, things like photonics and this application, they are also the nano antenna and all those uh, things. Uh, I might talk about them in some other platform. But uh, my point is that the characteristic is that the design of antennas at this high frequency and the terahertz frequency regime with different other materials, exotic materials, they also, I mean, play a significant role in the antenna research. But essentially, the characteristics of the antenna is a strong factor of the operating frequency. So again, I just like to uh, highlight that point a little bit. So coming back to the pertinent questions, like how do antennas radiate electromagnetic energy in space? This is a fundamental question that... Uh, occurs, I mean, in the mind of any student or any young professional who wants to uh, do a research on the antenna, and then how the energy and power is specially redirected or focused in some, some specific directions, like we call about the directive gain. Whether the orientation of the antenna, the polarization of the radiated waves that matter and how they matter, how to play with them, how to design linear to circular to other elliptical and uh, in this orbital angular momentum based systems. And then this is a serious part that is how to ensure that input power is actually launched in the free space to so imprints matching and the efficiency of the antenna system. And uh, finally, this point that multiple antenna and the integration of the multiple antenna in a system, be it in the transmitter, be it in the receiver, how to harness the information from these various antenna terminals and combine them to get a specific uh, capacity performance or to get a specific uh, um, uh, like uh, uh, inter-user, I mean, this uh, separation of uh, the suppression of the interference and noise level ratio to assign a ratio. So all those things can be done essentially by playing with the signal from the multiple antenna systems. So these are some of the pertinent questions and that occur in various stages of our uh, antenna research for different systems that we want to build our antennas for. So the research on antennas, some of the experience that I had and mostly I have shared with some of my other colleagues and roughly eventually in the academic institutions what we do, uh, we try to see the S parameters and we try to measure the radiation pattern and for some specific cases we try to do the like uh, with phantom kind of measurements for some specific devices and uh, if we are collaborating with some industry of course they can do the testing at that point so why i put this slide is i wanted to highlight that fabricating i mean for printed antenna or any antenna system fabricating the antenna system and doing measurements on that is the ultimate thing because ultimately we want to integrate that with the different uh, systems that is fine but when we try to analyze the system before that, like uh, before building our antenna system, we don't go for the fabrication right away. We have to build the antenna. We have to uh, envision what kind of structure do we need to design for some specific application. So that solving that problem requires historically how the, these applied electromagnetic problems are solved. They are based on a solid theory and we cannot avoid, if we are planning to solve any applied electromagnetic problem, we cannot avoid this Maxwell's equation. Actually, it's better to say that this is maxwell Heaviside equation, which has all those uh, interrelations between the quantities like electric flux density, magnetic flux density, electric field intensity, magnetic field intensity, and the current and all those stuff. And then we have the constitutive relations with us that connect the flux density with the field intensity. So, I mean, I will not go into explaining because this is not a classroom lecture anyway. So, uh, the uh, continuity equation, I mean, in the original uh, Maxwell equation, it was part of that and 20 or 25 equations, uh, how many I have exactly number I have forgot right now. So, but now 
for the present age we generally look into this uh, combined and compact set of things with the vector notation and not only the maxwell equation just knowing the maxwell equation will not lead us anywhere we have to solve the problem for a specific boundary condition so the top two i mean these are just the compact mathematical notation for the uh, like tangential component of the fields and the bottom two they are for the normal components of the field so i'll uh, not uh, go into the details again in this particular talk but my point is to uh, show you that the different uh, problems essentially uh, depends on the solution of the maxwell equation along with the con like uh, constitutive relation and the continuity equation within the proper electromagnetic boundary so that boundary let's say i take uh, this boundary condition like uh, uh, this particular one which says that okay there is some uh, discontinuity in terms of the surface current on any surface so you can say that okay this is a boundary condition what is its uh, utility i mean uh, why do we uh, need it or what help does it uh, do when we try to design any practical antenna system so let us take the example of that uh, aircraft kind of thing and i mean this is a very poor drawing but just i wanted to highlight the point so let's say this is your transmitter that is there or the radar part of thing and you want to illuminate your aircraft with some electromagnetic waves over there so what happens is if you try to uh, find out i mean uh, how much back scatter how much this uh, radar system or sorry no, not the radar system how much this aircraft is going to back scatter so in order to find out that you have to find out what is the induced surface current on this particular surface i mean particular uh, radar uh, i mean the aircraft body so how this surface current is induced i mean that key and that explanation how to quantify not i mean not how it is induced it is induced but how to quantify that surface current that essentially depends on the boundary condition that is there and from that boundary condition you can find out i mean uh, based on the discontinuity of the incident uh, magnetic field you can find out the surface current and that will give you the back scatter so the algorithms that will process all those things essentially have to be related to this is just one example i mean that that i that came to my mind right now so in order to uh, do all this analysis i mean there are ways that we can uh, do with uh, complete analytical tools and i mean if you look into the research that used to happen in this field many years back when we did not have computer systems that much advanced like vlsi and all those things started picking up uh, at the end of uh, 70s and probably uh, like when ics were developed and slowly things started picking up we used to have we uh, did not have this kind of uh, high performance computers at that time but now we are at a stage where we can use the computers to our aid in solving this kind of complex electromagnetic problems and essentially solution of the electromagnetic problems by some numerical techniques is the computational electromagnetics and it is the process of modeling the interaction of electromagnetic fields along with the physical objects and the environments and uh, right now uh, whatever research we do using antennas computational electromagnetic tools developed by various the uh, stakeholders various players many indian players many international i mean uh, uh, companies who have developed some robust tools some are like all are not multifunctional some are specialized for some certain application for example numerical that tool is specialized for the photonic devices and all it uses the finite difference time domain technique but there are other tools also i mean if you start uh, seeing into the analysis of large scale large scale problems and small scale problems there will be different types of computational electromagnetic tools so in analyzing these various problems starting from the antenna circuit systems to the radar cross section and this is a very key important thing that electromagnetic interference like the modeling of the interference that is caused probably if you design these different systems in a discrete way the power supply and all those things we will not probably see that some surge in the power supply how can it affect your vehicular electronics and that that is a very pertinent problem for the uh, like vehicular technology this radiated emission kind of things how that can actually cause your chip to malfunction for the defense and in the defense also we look into things like uh, design of uh, high 
uh, power electromagnetic pulses and how that affects the other electronics. So computational electromagnetics is the way along with some of the like robust other characterization techniques that can lead us to solving these problems, electromagnetic interference, electromagnetic compatibility, and this bioelectromagnetics. This is extremely essential when we are placing so much of the wireless uh, devices near us. So we have to be sure that how those things are actually affecting our uh, like uh, nearby environment. So uh, there are different uh, computational techniques. So I'll just like to ask, I mean, if I uh, take five, more, uh, five to 10 more minutes, is it okay? Yes, the, there will be no problem. You can do. Yeah. Please. Okay. 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 So, uh, like, which computational electromagnetic to choose? So the answer essentially lies uh, in the problem, as well as uh, we uh, we have already discussed that part. That this uh, complexity of materials. This is one thing, and another aspect is the electrical size of the system that we are trying to analyze. So you can see that uh, we have stated or we have actually taken this from this particular source that how the different uh, solution and like problem requirements are actually governing that which electromagnetic tool we are using. Let us say we are trying to model our bioelectromagnetic problem and then in that case your FEM and FDTD all these kind of things will come into the picture by finite element methods and finite difference time domain techniques where we need very fine resolution of the things of the different dielectric layers and the boundaries we want to model it with some kind of discretization so the idea is discretizing the problem into small small parts and then solving the maxwell equation with the proper boundary condition there through the computer so this is essentially the summary of what whatever we do but the scale of the problems like this small uh, like bow tie antenna kind of design and how it is actually uh, like this horn antenna is radiating or the Yagi wood antenna is radiating. So these systems we can model using these tools like FDTD and FEM. So these are the best suited. I mean, we can model using other tools also, but these are best suited for this particular regime. But as we uh, go higher into the, in terms of the electrical size, so then slowly we start putting, uh, like picking up the tools like method of moments and first multiple, I mean, uh, this multiple expansion kind of situation and the physical optics and geometrical optics, these are, I mean, very key uh, tools when we are, let's say we are trying to uh, model a particular like this uh, aircraft problem that I am saying that uh, the RCS determination. So there, if I try to break down the entire aircraft by some small FDTD grids, then it will be, I mean, even with the present day computational technique, it will be like a waste of the memory, it will be a waste of the uh, like computational time and more time it will be needed. So in that kind of situation, we need some other uh, like innovative solutions, mostly based on the physical optics and geometrical optics and uh, the uniform theory of diffraction that Prabhakar Pathak, I think many of us know him. In fact, he was the one to develop this particular tool, uniform theory of diffraction and not all computational solvers have that uh, UTD integrated with them. So that is for a very large system, like let's say a ship, and we want to find out the radar cross section on it due to some antenna that we have mounted on the system uh, due to, let's say, the navigation, I mean, uh, the positioning and the navigation purpose. So this is an integrated environment and there we need the computational electromagnetic technique. So not only the CM techniques are used to characterize the single antennas, like uh, single antenna by that I mean the two port or four port kind of system we find to find out the S parameters and get the radiation pattern the general stuff that we do when we uh, start uh, our I mean projects and all but when we install these antennas it into any practical application which is the real life demand then we need some more sophisticated computational electromagnetic techniques to actually solve that particular uh, problem like uh, multi physics kind of situation we also have to encounter how much heating is done how much uh, I mean uh, the scattering is being done by some buildings when we are let's say mounting a, a base station then we want to find out that okay how the um, uh, electromagnetic energy is dissipated in various locations due to the presence of different buildings so that requires computer sophisticated CEM tools and essentially that feedback is needed to design the proper antenna also 
sometimes some antenna solution we might have designed for a particular environment but it might not be suited for the other environment so we have to make the necessary changes now if we want to build the antenna and do the measurement and again come back that again requires a lot of like extra effort so that is why in between we have to we can plug in the particular model one very uh, like useful technique is using the infinitesimal dipole model of that particular antenna system and integrate with some uh, like installation scenario and see how it is actually behaving so this is uh, taken up by industries and they do this kind of research so i would like try before ending it i'll just uh, be, uh, like try to uh, expose you to one of the toolboxes i mean as i mentioned there are several other uh, like antenna simulation softwares and things that, that are used but in many of the institutions we already have the matlab license and if we have the matlab license then we can uh, use this antenna toolbox even online i mean uh, we can actually this matlab antenna toolbox it is accessible by logging into the math, math work server using the existing institute license or institute email id it is possible to access this one and uh, it will not require any installation in the local uh, drive you can simply use the online version in your uh, like uh, cell phone even i mean through the app or through the browser it can be done and essentially it is a solver based on the method of moments so uh, like uh, uses the electromagnetic solvers including the method of moments to compute the impedance current distribution efficiency and the near and far field uh, like uh, distributions of the antenna and it is also possible to import this stl and garber files of pre existing structures and export them to manufacture the design and then the final thing that i said that uh, side viewer enables you to visualize the antenna coverage on 3d terrain map so i mean this is not an ad for matlab antenna toolbox but uh, what i am trying to say is we can use this tool if we have access to matlab it is now possible Uh, for people working in different government institutes to use this particular tool to do some kind of like uh, basic uh, what the way i look into it is that uh, we can do it to explain the antenna concepts uh, before going into the theory uh, what uh, why i am saying it because uh, very often what happens is when we talk about the these electromagnetic concepts and the theory uh, due to the extensive maths that is involved which is anyway that will be Uh, required eventually but in order to it is important to develop a physical intuition and some physical idea without going into or without working on the complicated mathematics so through some simple coding and simple visualization if we can do that then i believe that is more uh, like appealing to the students who might be interested to contribute in this various research direction that i presented uh, earlier like let's say starting from the cell phone design to design of the um, antenna systems for planetary communication and uh, your uh, tv antennas and starting from the bioelectromagnetics so these areas many people can be interested to work on but it is important to just bypass the maths for the uh, initial stages in order to develop the appropriate physical insight and after that maths can come and interested people can also work on developing some innovative algorithms and analytical techniques that is relevant but it is important to go through the computation electromagnetic route in order to do that so this antenna toolbox i have just uh, like put a very simple example and to just demonstrate that how easy it is so the code snippet i have put in the left hand side and how it it, it uh, demonstrates actually so you can see that it's a few line code i mean 1 2 3 4 5 6 and this entire thing is 7 8 so 8 to 9 line code you can write in in the matlab you can define the design frequency i've just chosen i mean this is a typical frequency that in indian 5g test bed and iic is also looking into this frequency like 28 gigahertz let's say i want to design a simple half wavelength dipole antenna at that frequency and observe its characteristics so uh we can write this code and if you run this one you will get uh this particular response that will uh, show that this strip dipole the feed is not visible i mean from this picture but from the like uh, matlab port uh, like, like uh, window that it will open when you run this code it will open and you can see that the feed is i mean roughly uh, located in the central location so it is a center feed kind of dipole so essentially the structure that it is modeling it is 
is some kind of uh, like a very thin strip and in between that we are having this particular feed so here so this is your feed and this is your antenna and the length of the entire thing the way i defined here is the length i chose as some l dipole well suffix is not possible here so i choose l dip like the length and the width i chose very narrow like this is the width of the system that became like w dipole over here so w dipole i have chosen very uh, like small very very thin so this is a thin wire kind of system so you can see that just this simple one line code is actually modeling the dipole we choose the dipole of having a particular length l dip and particular width w dipole so interested people who are uh, i mean uh, interested to work in this direction they can simply uh, use this code and frequency design we define as 28 gigahertz and we design the lambda in terms of just simply it is nothing but the well known formula that we have that lambda is equal to c upon your uh, operating frequency f so this is essentially what we are doing and we choose the as 0.45 lambda and uh, so you can take any value you can take 0.1 lambda and stuff like that and this is to uh, like to demonstrate uh, to show it so this is just the visualization of the antenna element so what about the practical i mean uh, the characterization of the antenna element so this part of the code is same just the bottom part i mean the red part i have i am changing con continuously so i choose the frequency range from uh, 20 gigahertz uh, to 40 gigahertz at some 0.5 gigahertz uh, spacing uh, i mean this is probably taken from 25 to anyway I, uh, like the axis of it is taken from 25 not 20 so this particular one liner impedance dipole one frequency range that is giving you the impedance performance and you can see that okay this point there is some the reactance curve is actually crossing uh, i mean the 100 region and if you see at this point like this is uh, close to the design frequency it is crossing the zero point so here it is around 100 here it is around zero so zero reactance and some resistance is there that will be actually leading to the proper impedance match and that is exactly what will happen so here again i have this code like s parameters from uh, yeah here in this plot actually it is from 20 i have presented previous one i took the axis from here so s parameters dipole one frequency range and this but another code like rf plot so matlab has the complete documentation for all these small codes and uh it is very easy to plug in like this is just one of the dipole it already has a built in antenna library so any kind of antenna starting from the patch starting from the helical and all those all these things are pre done yagi uda and all those kind of things and simply by using that tool you can demonstrate the s parameters and uh, well s parameters in impedance is one thing but we will be interested in to looking into the radiation pattern of the antenna so let us also show that that it is again dependent on this simple pattern dipole one at the frequency desired so we have frequency designed at 28 gigahertz so at, at 28 gigahertz you can see it is showing the directivity pattern and maximum value is 2.06 dbi and the minimum value is minus 49 but i have scaled the color map from the minus 30 to something the same thing that we many of us who are working on the hfss and cst and other kind of tools they do it on those kind of solvers but i mean for educational purpose i feel that this is a very handy tool for people who have access to matlab and because you do not need any other installation any other uh, like your computer system or existing systems are not burdened by any new thing and uh, it is essentially free for people who or institutes who have the matlab licenses i mean that's the way when i was in iit rupar for some time i used it with the iit rupar institute license when i am in isc i use with the isc institute license so i am pretty sure that uh, other institutes can also uh, access this facility so with that uh, i'll try to uh, conclude the talk i hope i have not overshooted uh, 530 okay i still have some time so the idea is that use uh, cm bas platform to explain the basic physical aspects of antennas to students and this input impedance matching and pattern and gain that can be done like uh, i showed matlab antenna toolbox which is based on mom there are other tools several other tools developed by other people that can be used 
and after that once they develop these basic ideas from the knowledge of the current i did not show how to extract the current pattern but that is also possible from the antenna toolbox so once we have the idea about the currents and all those things then we can think of using the analytical techniques use of the greens functions and critical study of the antenna currents and uh, installed antenna performance that is facility is there and co simulation with the circuit solvers that facility is also there rfic signal integrity with other tools i mean not probably antenna toolbox but uh, tools like key site ads that can be used so another thing finally i would like to say that retrospective studies on the mismatch between measurement and simulation result sometime what we say we simply write in the papers that oh this is some mismatch here due to soldering issues or something but it is important to develop a particular analytical insight and use cm tools to see probably what went wrong which part of the system is not behaving according to our plan and why that is causing this mismatch between the measurement and simulation because this is not like a maths exam where we have to match the measurement and simulation by some way it is about the like mismatches sometime also lead to some innovative new strategy or solution so before i end i will uh, briefly like uh, like to inform you about this new ipcc ap society young professional uh, initiative uh, in which i am part of this is a global committee that has been formed by the ap society and uh, currently it is chaired by uh, dr cj reddy from altair and it has representatives from various stakeholders starting from the industry to the academia and i am representing uh, i mean this part of the world so uh, we will uh, if you go into the ap society web page you can find more about the activities that will be done in this ages of ipcc aps young professionals and this particular lecture uh, uh, the contents of this lecture will be uh, probably i mean in few days uh, you will get to know it will probably appear in some of the ipcc ap magazine uh, issue so uh, thank you for your attention and, and i would love to take any questions thanks uh so thank you dr sarkar uh, for this very much nice and uh, this informative session and uh, participants are requested uh, to ask any questions any queries uh, if you have you can unmute and you can ask the questions directly yeah that will be nice actually